Welcome to this My Health PD presentation. Today we will be discussing advanced life support theory. This presentation acts as a refresher, building on previously understood ALS concepts to keep your knowledge up to date. Please note, practical assessment should still be undertaken locally to demonstrate and maintain ALS competency. Resuscitating a patient who has experienced a cardiac arrest involves several essential stages, sometimes referred to as the chain of survival. Here we'll simplify it into the three most common phases. First, we have basic life support. During this crucial phase, the focus is recognising the emergency, sending for help and commencing CPR. This phase focuses on maintaining oxygenated blood flow. We ensure the heart remains warm, adequately perfused, oxygen-rich and in a balanced pH state. Moving on to the next stage, advanced life support and the focus of this presentation. Here, our goal shifts to restarting the heart, utilising specialised tools like defibrillators, targeted drugs and strategic interventions until return of spontaneous circulation occurs. Finally, we enter the phase of intensive care after resuscitation. This critical period centres on meticulous and vigilant care as we monitor and support the patient's outcome, working to optimise the chances of a successful recovery. Remember, any attempt at resuscitation is better than no attempt at all. The programme is divided into several sections. At the end of each section, you will be required to complete a number of questions to assess your understanding of advanced life support theory. So let's begin. Responsibilities. In the realm of nursing, comprehending your professional obligations while executing medical procedures takes centre stage. This becomes particularly vital when you're engaged in tasks that demand specialised expertise and insight. When you affix your signature to your yearly nursing registration, you're making a commitment to uphold these very professional obligations. Australia's Nursing and Midwifery Board, the NMBA, has established comprehensive national competency standards tailored to registered nurses. These standards lay down the bedrock of your responsibilities within your day-to-day -day clinical practice. The following points provided here are reflective of key aspects within the NMBA competency standards. As we review these points, reflect upon your role in advanced life support. As a nurse, you must perform only those clinical procedures for which you have been educationally prepared and in which you have demonstrated competence. This preparation must include theory and supervised clinical practice and be within your scope of practice. Maintenance of knowledge and competence in performing clinical procedures is essential and it is the responsibility of the individual to ensure your competence is maintained through regular review. At all times you are accountable and responsible for your own actions and need to be aware of the limits of your knowledge and competence and to act within these. In alignment with national and international protocols, healthcare organisations create policies and guidelines. For advanced life support, here in Australia we draw from ANSCOR, the regional representative in the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation, which includes the Australian Resuscitation Council and the New Zealand Resuscitation Council. It is from these guidelines, recently updated in 2021, that organisations align and update their own ALS policy and procedures, aiming to deliver the best, most up-to-date practice during a cardiac arrest. This regular review keeps standards high, therefore ensuring the best outcome for the victim. Now, pause and ask yourself, am I familiar with my organisation's ALS policy? If not, make sure to access and thoroughly read the policy, ensuring it is up to date and mirrors your role's expectations. Advanced life support is an extension of the scope of practice for the ordinary nurse. To administer ALS, you need specialised skills, up-to-date knowledge and your organisation's approval. Find this approval in your protocols, policies or standing orders. The authorisation outlines when ALS can be applied as these may differ dependent of your area and location. For example, protocols may differ between regional and metropolitan hospitals and clinics. Regularly review and update these documents to ensure alignment with your organisation's practices. Now pause and reflect. How does ALS fit into your clinical scope? Although we address the theory in this presentation, when was the last time you applied your practical knowledge? If significant time has passed, 
consider re-attending practical workshops to keep your skills fresh. Basic life support is the preservation or restoration of life by the establishment of and or the maintenance of airway breathing and circulation. Adjunctive equipment is not necessary to perform BLS. That said, the ANSCOR guidelines include the use of automated external defibrillators or AEDs within the scope of BLS. These are the appropriate defibrillators to be used by first responders who are likely to lack expertise in the recognition of life-threatening cardiac arrhythmias. ALS then is basic life support with the addition of invasive techniques including defibrillation, advanced airway management and intravenous access and drug therapy. The objective of BLS is to sustain myocardial and cerebral oxygenation until defibrillation or specialised personnel equipped for advanced life support become accessible. Serving to uphold ventilation and circulation, BLS is essentially a temporary intervention due to the following reasons. Number one, effective external cardiac compression only offers a cardiac output of around 20 to 30% of its pre-arrest level. And number two, employing expired air in rescue breathing, if employed, provides ventilation with an inspired oxygen of a concentration of merely 15 to 18%, in contrast to the 21% present in ambient room air. This is why bag valve mask ventilation with 15 litres per minute flow of oxygen is recommended to be employed as soon as it is available, as this increases the inspired oxygen concentration up to around 90 to 95%. In certain BLS scenarios, adjunctive airways can be employed to optimise airway management and ventilation. These adjuncts assist in maintaining proper oxygenation and ventilation during resuscitation efforts. Some common adjunctive airways include oral pharyngeal airways or OPAs, these devices help prevent the tongue from obstructing the upper airway, facilitating effective ventilation. OPAs are particularly useful when the patient is unconscious or lacks muscle tone. Nasal pharyngeal airways or NPAs. NPAs provide a clear pathway for airflow through the nasal passages, often chosen when oral insertion is challenging or inappropriate. Supraglottic airways and laryngeal mask airway. These devices sit above the glottis, enabling a clear passage for airflow and effective ventilation. They are often used in theatre and are suitable when conventional ventilation is difficult to achieve. The gold standard in airway management remains to be the endotracheal tube, or ETT. ETTs are inserted into the trachea, ensuring a secure airway and allowing precise control over ventilation and oxygenation. These also have the potential added benefit of being equipped to record end tidal CO2 levels. The selection of an adjunctive airway depends on the patient's condition anatomical considerations and the rescuer's skill level and equipment availability. Proper insertion and positioning are crucial to ensure optimal airway management during life-saving interventions. Improving outcomes. Evidence has shown that the optimal potential for achieving long-term, neurologically intact survival following cardiac arrest is greatly enhanced under the following conditions. Witnessed collapse. When the patient's collapse is witnessed by someone, it allows for prompt recognition of the event and immediate initiation of life-saving measures. Immediate CPR. The moment cardiac arrest is identified, the immediate commencement of CPR significantly improves the chances of successful resuscitation. As mentioned previously, it helps maintain blood flow and oxygen delivery to vital organs. Cardiac rhythm. If the cardiac rhythm detected is ventricular fibrillation, VF, or pulseless ventricular tachycardia, VT. There's a higher likelihood of successful defibrillation and restoration of normal heart rhythm. Prompt defibrillation. The swift application of defibrillation is critical. Administering a shock to the heart as soon as possible can successfully reset the rhythm and potentially lead to the return of spontaneous circulation. In essence, the synergy of these factors, witnessing the collapse, immediate CPR, appropriate cardiac rhythm, and rapid defibrillation creates an optimal environment for achieving a positive outcome and preserving neurological function after cardiac arrest. Introducing ALS measures. As you examine the flow diagram shown here, you can gain a solid perspective on the seamless interplay between ALS and BLS within the hospital environment. This representation underscores how critical life-saving protocols build and complement one another ultimately striving toward optimal patient outcomes. Remember, 
Whether it's the immediate initiation of CPR in BLS or the intricate techniques employed in ALS, every step contributes synergistically to the overarching goal of preserving life. The core process for ALS is encapsulated under the Advanced Life Support for Adults algorithm taken from the 2021 ANSCORE guidelines. This familiar resource takes the form of a dynamic flowchart akin to a decision tree. Within this algorithm lay the pivotal rules of resuscitation for a patient found to be unresponsive and not breathing. So let's run through them now to refresh our understanding. Firstly, assess danger and ensure safety. Before approaching the patient, ensure the scene is safe for both the rescuers and the patient. Check response. Tap and shout to check if the patient is responsive. A good acronym for this is COWS, standing for Can You Hear Me? Open your eyes. What's your name? Squeeze my hands. Call for help. If the patient is unresponsive, call for assistance and activate the emergency response system. Assess airway and check breathing. Look, listen and feel for normal breathing. If the patient is not breathing or breathing abnormally, such as agonal gasps, proceed to CPR. Start with a compression to ventilation ratio of 30 compressions to two breaths. Defibrillation. As soon as an AED or manual defibrillator is available, apply pads and assess the cardiac rhythm. If a shockable rhythm such as VF or pulseless VT is detected, deliver a defibrillatory shock. Airway management. Secure the airway using advanced techniques and equipment such as an ETT if possible and appropriate. If not already present, establish intravenous or intraosseous access for drug administration. Depending on the rhythm and clinical context, prepare to administer the appropriate drugs such as adrenaline or amiodarone. Reassess rhythm and pulse. Regularly check the cardiac rhythm and the presence of a pulse after cycles of CPR. Post-resuscitation. Care. If a return of spontaneous circulation is achieved, provide post-resuscitation care, including optimising ventilation and oxygenation and maintaining blood pressure. Re-evaluate the patient systematically treat precipitating causes of the arrest and consider the need for aspects like targeted temperature management. Transportation. Depending on the location the arrest occurs, ensure the patient is transported to an appropriate medical facility for ICU care. As we can see, this is a very high level overview and there are many nuances and variations within each step, depending on the patient's circumstances and the resources available, some of which we will now go on to discuss. Effective CPR is vital for maintaining some blood flow to the heart and brain during cardiac arrest. Although you may feel confident and competent in conducting chest compressions, as an ALS responder, it is important to remember you may need to coach those less experienced participants around should you observe ineffective technique. So let us review the major concepts. First, we have hand positioning. Place the heel of one hand on the centre of the person's chest specifically on the lower half of the sternum. Place your other hand on top of the first hand. Interlace your fingers if desired, but ensure that the fingers are not pressing on the ribs. Ensure that your elbows are fully extended and your shoulders are positioned directly above your hands. This position will allow you to use your upper body weight to help with compressions, reducing fatigue. Next, we have compression depth. For adults, compress the chest downward at least five centimeters for an effective compression, aiming not to overcompress past about six centimeters. For speed, compress the chest at a rate of 100 to 120 compressions per minute. It might be helpful for some people to think of the beat of the song Stayin' Alive by the Bee Gees as a reference for the proper tempo. To demonstrate this, here is what 120 beats per minute sounds like. <coughs> Lastly, recoil. Allow the chest to fully recoil and come back to its original position between compressions. This is essential as it allows the heart to refill with blood before the next compression. Therefore, ensure the person does not lean on the chest. Although not part of a compression itself, it is always important to minimize any interruptions to chest compressions and resume compressions as soon as possible after any necessary interruption, like checking the rhythm or delivering a shock with a defibrillator. Ensuring clear communication amongst all participants can greatly assist with this, such as counting out loud the number of compressions completed. 
Based on the 2021 ANSCOR guidelines, a precordial thump is described as a single sharp blow delivered by a rescuer's fist to a victim's mid-sternum. This technique may be considered for patients with monitored pulseless ventricular tachycardia when a defibrillator isn't immediately available. However, its efficacy is limited for VF and thus it's not recommended for this rhythm. The guidelines also indicate that there's not enough evidence to advise for or against its use in cases of witnessed onset of a systole resulting from AV conduction disturbances. The precordial thump should be avoided in unwitnessed cardiac arrests, patients with recent defibrillation decisions. As discussed, when faced with a cardiac emergency, one of the foremost steps is to promptly begin CPR, especially if accessing the defibrillator might entail a delay. Once accessible, the defibrillator or monitor should be attached to the patient as this allows for a determination of the cardiac rhythm and subsequently deciding on the necessity for defibrillation. So let us discuss some of the specifics surrounding this aspect. According to the guidelines, the prime consideration in any shockable cardiac rhythm is defibrillation, irrespective of the employed method. There are fundamentally two main types of defibrillators that help us to achieve this, and these are 1. Manual defibrillators, used by trained healthcare professionals such as yourselves, who can discern abnormal heart rhythms and decide on the requisite response. 2. Automated external defibrillators, or sometimes called shock advisory defibrillators. These are designed to autonomously diagnose the cardiac rhythm and conclude if a shock is necessary, guiding the rescuer throughout. Depending on the device type, these will administer shocks utilising one of two electrical waveforms, biphasic or monophasic, so we need to better understand what the difference between these waveforms represent. Monophasic defibrillators. These devices work by delivering a single directional shock from one paddle to the other. The energy is transferred in one direction across the heart. When using monophasic defibrillators on adults, they usually initiate defibrillation at a higher energy level. The energy delivered is often between 200 to 360 joules. This higher energy requirement is due to the unidirectional nature of the shock, and subsequent shocks may necessitate increased energy if the initial shock is unsuccessful. In contrast, biphasic defibrillators are designed to send the electrical current in one direction and then swiftly reverse its flow, sending it in the opposite direction. This bidirectional flow enhances the chances of successful defibrillation while typically using less energy. For adults, the starting energy levels with biphasic defibrillators generally range from 120 to 200 joules. If the initial shock doesn't achieve its intended result, the energy level can be adjusted based on the patient's response and the device's recommendations. This waveform's efficiency means that often lower joules can be effective in restoring a regular heart rhythm. Defibrillation detailed. We have revised the importance of defibrillation in cardiac emergencies, but what actually transpires during the process? Defibrillation is fundamentally centered around the deployment of an electrical shock, often referred and documented as DCCS or direct current countershock. When this shock is administered through the chest, it seeks to achieve simultaneous depolarization of a substantial mass of myocardial cells. The primary objective is to quell any ongoing disorganized electrical activity, thereby enabling the heart's inherent pacemaker to re-establish organized electrical patterns and take back control of cardiac contractions. The application of a defibrillatory shock is expressly recommended for VF and pulseless VT and instances where there's fine or isoelectric ventricular fibrillation, which can be deceptively similar in appearance to asystole. The intricacies of defibrillation span the selection of equipment, understanding their operational differences and the specific waveform to be utilized. Therefore, thorough grasp of these components is crucial for delivering effective cardiac care. Reflect on this aspect and take time to re-familiarize yourself with the equipment available in your clinical environment. For successful defibrillation, the initial step is ensuring correct pad placement on the patient. Proper positioning of the pads is essential as it facilitates the optimal passage of the electrical current through the heart, increasing the likelihood of restoring a normal rhythm. For adults, there are two variations to pad placement. 
First is the anterior to lateral placement. Here, one pad is positioned on the upper right side of the chest, just below the clavicle. The other pad is placed on the lower left side, mid-axillary as shown in the diagram. This setup is beneficial because it captures the heart between the two pads, optimizing the electric current's path through the myocardium. The second option is for anterior to posterior placement. In this configuration, the anterior pad is positioned in the anterior lateral placement, on the upper right side below the clavicle. The posterior pad is placed on the left side of the back, between the spine and the scapula at the heart level. This positioning ensures a thorough dispersion of the electric current across the heart and is particularly useful when extended CPR is expected or during patient transportation. For paediatric patients, the pads are placed in the anterior and posterior locations, as shown. This is due to the smaller size of paediatric patients. The anterior pad is placed in the centre of the chest while the posterior pad goes directly opposite on the back. This captures the smaller heart between the pads, ensuring an effective current path through the myocardium. Although adults are the focus of this presentation, we thought it beneficial to briefly detour as we outline some key aspects about paediatric pads. When it comes to the young population, especially infants and children, the selection of defibrillation equipment is crucial. The heart's anatomy and electrical conductivity differ from that of adults, which mandates a distinct approach. Special paediatric pads, such as those for the widely used FR2, as pictured, have been specifically designed with children's safety in mind. These pads contain built-in electronics that modulate the shock energy, attenuating it from 150 joules to a more appropriate 50 for infants and smaller children. Additionally, the design of the paediatric pads has been carefully conceptualised to ensure clear differentiation from adult pads. The inclusion of easily recognisable symbols, like a teddy bear, immediately signifies their intended use for children and infants. This clarity in design is especially crucial during emergencies, ensuring that even the most inexperienced individuals under high-stress conditions can quickly identify and correctly use the appropriate pads for the patient's age group. Manual defibrillators are the first choice for infants and children due to the ability they offer to titrate or adjust the amount of energy delivered, depending on the patient's size and needs. However, in situations where a manual defibrillator is not immediately available, you should always follow local policy and procedures. However, the following guidelines are suggested. In children over eight years, in the absence of a manual defibrillator, an AED can be used. This is because their physiology is closer to adults, making the standard AED settings applicable. However, for infants and children under eight years, the order of preference is a bit more delineated. Firstly, if available, always opt for a manual defibrillator. If a manual defibrillator is not at hand, the next best option is an AED with paediatric attenuation. This equipment is designed to adjust and reduce the energy delivered to make it suitable for a child's heart. Lastly, if neither of the above options is accessible, a standard AED may be used, but with caution, understanding that it's not the optimal choice for this age group. In summary, while manual defibrillators remain the gold standard for paediatric defibrillation, AEDs with appropriate adjustments or settings can serve as viable alternatives in emergency scenarios. Now, take a moment and reflect. Does your location's crash cart have paediatric pads? Are they recommended for manual or AED use? Is your local paediatric rhesus protocol available and up to date? The infrequency of paediatric arrests in relation to adults can cause our knowledge and skills to diminish. Reflect on your own practice and assess if this also needs to be refreshed. Elements of successful defibrillation. In addition to appropriate pad size and position, there are other factors that you as the clinician need to consider when preparing to defibrillate a victim. Above all, it is important to make sure that the pads are completely adhered to the victim's skin. Air pockets or gaps between skin and the pads can lead to the possibility of arcing and burns. To avoid this, apply one edge of the pad securely to the patient. Roll the pad smoothly from the applied edge to the other, being careful not to trap any air pockets between the pad and the skin. Items on a victim's body can interfere with the delivered current, 
and some elements can even create impedance or resistance to current. Therefore, to ensure the best possible outcome, consider the following as you prepare the victim prior to defibrillation. Jewelry. Remove all of a victim's metal jewelry, including nipple piercings and necklaces that may come in contact with electrodes. Chest hair. If the victim has excessive chest hair, rapidly shave it with the razor before you apply pads to ensure proper adhesion. Breast tissue. Significant breast tissue can contribute to transthoracic impedance. To accommodate for this, the ANSCOR guideline recommends placing the electrode beneath the tissue, using one hand to elevate the breast tissue and the other to apply the pad. Moisture. Excessive moisture can interfere with adhesion and electricity conduction. Move the victim and the AED away from sources of water, remove any wet clothing and dry the victim to the best of your ability before applying electrodes. Adequate pressure. Pad placement depends on adequate pressure when adhering the pads to a victim, so it's best to press down as firmly as possible to ensure proper application. When carrying out ALS defibrillation, several vital precautions are paramount to safeguard both the victim and the rescuers. To begin, care must be taken to prevent oxygen from a bag valve mask from flowing onto the victim's chest during shock delivery, as this poses a significant fire hazard. It's equally crucial to keep the victim away from contact with metallic fixtures like bed rails, which can cause burns. Most importantly, one should avoid any situation where individuals, including responders, could have direct or indirect contact with the victim during defibrillation. This includes potential contact through medical apparatuses such as IV fluid bags and invasive lines, given the risk of shock transmission. As a culminating safety measure, prior to initiating defibrillation, the all clear message should be clearly conveyed and acknowledged by all present to ensure a secure environment. As we previously identified, a critical difference between manual and automated defibrillators is that with a manual defibrillator, the operator is required to identify the rhythm, dial up the jewels, place the pads, and commence hands-on defibrillation. Whereas an AED identifies whether the rhythm is shockable or not, and via voice prompts, directs the operator to either commence CPR or defibrillate, this requires little user input and no rhythm recognition. However, as an ALS practitioner, it is essential, even with an AED, for us to be able to recognise the shockable and the non-shockable rhythms, understanding the protocols for each. Understanding specific cardiac arrhythmias is paramount in ALS. These rhythms can be broadly categorised into two main groups, the four life-threatening arrhythmias and those rhythm irregularities that can manifest during the peri-arrest periods. The timely recognition and intervention of these lethal rhythms are foundational, guiding the most appropriate and effective interventional measures. So let's refresh our understanding of them now. First up, we have asystole, often referred to as a flatline. Asystole represents a state of no cardiac electrical activity, leading to no cardiac output and a cessation of blood flow throughout the body. Next, we have pulseless electrical activity, or PEA. PEA is a condition where the heart's electrical activity remains, but the mechanical pumping action fails to produce a pulse. It's a paradoxical state where electrical rhythms are present without corresponding mechanical heart function. Both of these are non-shockable. Next is pulseless ventricular tachycardia, often shortened to VT or VTAC. This is a rapid heart rhythm originating from the heart's lower chambers, or ventricles, that is so fast it prevents the heart from filling adequately with blood. Consequently, the heart can't pump enough blood to the body, leading to the lack of a pulse. Lastly, we have ventricular fibrillation, also known as VF or V-fib. In this chaotic heart rhythm, the heart's lower chambers quiver ineffectively. The heart can't pump blood, causing a cessation of circulation and a rapid loss of consciousness. Immediate intervention is essential to restore an organised rhythm, with these two arrhythmias being shockable and requiring defibrillation. Let us now dive into these life-threatening arrhythmias in a little more detail, starting with asystole. On the ECG, asystole presents as what we previously referred to as a flatline. This means you won't see the usual P, QRS or T waves. It's just a flat baseline. However, P wave asystole can sometimes be seen, as shown. Here, P waves are present without accompanying QRS complex, 
indicating atrial activity without subsequent ventricular contraction. Now, it's always a good idea to check this across multiple leads because you want to rule out issues like lead disconnection. Clinically, a patient in a systole is in a dire state. They'll be unconscious without any detectable pulse, showing no signs of life, no breathing, movement or responsiveness. Their pupils often appear dilated and don't react to light, and their skin can become pale or even bluish from the lack of circulating oxygen. Now let's look at the other non-shockable rhythm, pulseless electrical activity. When reviewing the cardiac monitor or ECG, PEA is characterized by the presence of organized electrical activity. However, despite this electrical activity, there's a paradox as there is no corresponding mechanical heart activity. This means the heart has electrical rhythms that normally should produce a pulse, but for various reasons, they aren't leading to effective contractions of the heart muscle. Clinical manifestation. A patient in PEA will present as unconscious with no palpable pulse. Their breathing will either be absent or ineffective. Essentially, the clinical picture is similar to asystole in terms of the lack of signs of life, despite the differences seen on the ECG. The crucial point to understand is that while the ECG might show electrical rhythms, the absence of a pulse confirms the diagnosis of PEA and ALS interventions should proceed. Once asystole or PEA is confirmed, commence CPR immediately, as discussed previously, ensuring minimal interruptions to the compressions. Provide oxygen-enriched ventilations, ensuring a secure airway. Depending on the patient's condition, this might involve bag mask ventilation or advanced airway management techniques like intubation. When more personnel are available to do so, establish intravenous or intraosseous access quickly. This allows for the administration of emergency medications, if deemed necessary, always following local guidelines and policy. According to the AN's core guidelines, 1 mg adrenaline can be administered as soon as IV or IO access is available, and then every 3 to 5 minutes or every second loop of CPR. After every 2 minute cycle of CPR, quickly check the cardiac rhythm. If asystole persists, continue CPR. If a shockable rhythm appears, use the defibrillator as appropriate. Always consider potential reversible causes and treat them as identified. The common ones can be remembered by the acronym 4Hs and 4Ts. Continuously communicate with the resuscitation team, ensuring everyone is aware of interventions, rhythm checks and other vital steps, as these all still need to be documented. Also, ensure understanding and acknowledgement of any orders or changes in the plan of care. This task is generally assumed by the ALS team leader or most senior medical personnel in attendance. Rescuers should persist with resuscitation efforts until return of spontaneous circulation is achieved. If ROSC is not attained, ALS interventions should continue until a medical officer makes the decision to terminate efforts and the patient is pronounced deceased. Now let's look at the shockable rhythms, starting with ventricular tachycardia or VT. On an ECG, VT is characterized by a rapid series of wide and irregular QRS complexes, occurring at a rate often exceeding 100 beats per minute. These abnormal complexes arise from the ventricles, giving them their distinct, broad appearance. P waves might be sporadically present, but if so, they aren't typically linked with the QRS complexes. Clinical manifestation. The clinical impact of VT hinges on the heart's compromised ability to circulate blood effectively. When the heart enters VT, the rapid and irregular ventricular contractions diminish the heart's pumping efficiency, causing reduced blood flow to vital organs, including the brain. This compromised perfusion is the primary reason a patient with sustained VT may fall unconscious. If the VT is episodic, a patient may remain conscious with a pulse. However, symptoms like palpitations, dizziness, chest discomfort or breathlessness may manifest due to the heart's impaired pumping capacity. In the context of pulseless VT, this inefficiency is even more pronounced. Such a patient will be unresponsive, lack a detectable pulse and will either have ineffective or no breathing at all. In the ALS context, pulseless VT is of paramount concern and requires immediate defibrillation. Moving on to the next life-threatening, shockable rhythm, ventricular fibrillation. On the ECG, VF presents as a chaotic and rapid series of waveforms of varying amplitude and shape. 
there's no recognisable QRS complex, T-wave or regular rhythm. The electrical activity is highly disorganised, representing multiple random impulses firing within the ventricles, which results in the heart quivering rather than effectively contracting. Clinical manifestation. A patient in VF will be unconscious as the heart is not pumping blood or oxygen to the brain or other vital organs. There will be an absence of a pulse or blood pressure. Breathing will also be absent, leading to cyanosis. The patient's pupils may become dilated and unreactive to light. Immediate intervention is necessary. As with VT, VF is incompatible with life if not rapidly addressed. Without prompt treatment, both of these will typically progress to asystole, representing a complete absence of cardiac electrical activity. Now that we better understand these shockable rhythms, let's look at how they can be managed using the ANSCOR algorithm. If the patient is unconscious and not breathing, initiate CPR immediately with high quality chest compressions. Apply the defibrillator as soon as possible. If the rhythm is shockable, namely pulseless VT and VF, administer a defibrillatory shock as soon as it is safe to do so. Continue with immediate post-shock CPR for two minutes. Secure the airway and manage rescue breaths as discussed previously. Secure IV or IO access and administer adrenaline as soon as access is established and then approximately every four minutes or every second loop. Repeat this CPR cycle, ensuring minimal interruptions to chest compressions. After the third defibrillation attempt, if VF or VT persists, administer 300 mg of amiodirone, either IV or IO. A repeat dose of 150 mg can be given if VF-VT continues after the next shock. Post-resuscitation care. If return of spontaneous circulation is achieved, post-resuscitation care should be initiated. As usual, review and address potential reversible causes of the arrest. If sinus rhythm is re-established and it is deemed appropriate to do so, an amiodarone infusion may be ordered. This is due to its action to reduce the irritability of the cardiac cells and help prevent further arrhythmias. However, remember that it is incompatible with saline and an alternative fluid like 5% dextrose should be used instead. As we have seen during ALS, efficient and effective drug administration is essential to optimize patient outcomes. Intravenous access remains the preferred route for drug delivery. When establishing IV access, choosing a large peripheral vein is advantageous as it ensures rapid drug delivery and allows for larger volumes to be infused. However, in situations where peripheral IV access proves challenging, or if available, a central line may be used. If both IV methods fail or are not feasible, intraosseous or IO access serves as a reliable alternative. Devices like the Easy IO device provide a means to access the marrow cavity at sites such as the proximal tibia or humerus facilitating immediate drug delivery. Once a drug is administered, especially during a resuscitation effort, it is vital to promptly follow with a generous flush. This ensures that the drug is propelled into the central circulation, making certain that it reaches its intended site of action swiftly. The rapid administration is critical for the drug to exert its therapeutic effect in a timely manner. In some rare instances, when all vascular access routes are unattainable, Drugs can be administered via the endotracheal tube or ETT. However, this is not an optimal route due to uncertain absorption and possible requirement for higher doses. It's essential to note that dosages and drugs suitable for endotracheal administration might differ from those given IV or IO. Always consult and adhere to local guidelines and policies when considering ETT drug administration. Although we have touched on them briefly, it's crucial to understand and promptly address the reversible causes of an arrest as part of the broader resuscitation strategy. Identifying and treating the underlying cause swiftly can significantly impact the patient's chance of survival. They provide a framework for healthcare professionals to systematically consider and address resuscitation efforts and are categorized into the well-known four H's and four T's. Starting with the four H's, we have hypoxia. This is the lack of adequate oxygen supply to the body. It's crucial to ensure that the airway is patent and that the patient is being adequately ventilated and oxygenated. Hypovolemia. This is a decrease in the volume of blood circulating in the body. 
Causes could include trauma, dehydration, or severe bleeding such as gastrointestinal bleeding or ruptured ectopic pregnancy. Hypothermia is a dangerously low body temperature. While less common, it is a recognised cause of cardiac arrest, especially in certain environments or situations, for example drowning in cold water. Hyperkalemia or hyperkalemia. These are potassium imbalances in the body with both too much or too little potassium potentially affecting the heart's rhythm and leading to cardiac arrest. Moving on to the four T's we have toxins, Overdoses such as from opioids, benzodiazepines and other toxic ingestions or exposures can lead to an arrest, cardiac tamponade. This refers to fluid accumulation in the pericardial space which can compress the heart and impede its function. Tension pneumothorax. This is a build-up of air in the pleural space, usually due to trauma or a ruptured lung, which can put pressure on the heart and lungs, compromising blood flow and ventilation. And finally, thrombosis. This can refer to pathologies such as a pulmonary embolism in the lungs or a blood clot in the coronary arteries causing an MI. Due to the often high stress environment which surrounds a cardiac arrest, it can be helpful to remember the following mnemonic to help guide a systematic approach to ALS activities. Here's a breakdown of the coached method. C is for compressions. The person in charge of the defibrillator will say compressions continue to guide those conducting CPR. O is for oxygen away. Again, the person in charge of the defibrillator will say oxygen away. Any provided oxygen at this point is to be removed at least one meter away from the patient. A is for all others clear. The same person will say everyone else stand clear or words to this effect. Here, everyone other than the person conducting the compressions is to stand clear of the patient. C is for charging. The defibrillator is charged to the appropriate jewels. H is for hands off, I'm safe. Now the person in charge of the defibrillator tells the compression person, hands off. At this point, the person doing compressions is to stop and step away from the patient, raise their hands in the air and respond with, I'm safe. E is for evaluate rhythm. The victim's rhythm is evaluated and deemed shockable or non-shockable. This is vocalized to the team. And finally, D is for defibrillation or disarm charge. Either the patient is defibrillated, if in a shockable rhythm, or the defibrillator is disarmed and the charge dumped prior to a pulse check for ROSC. Incorporating the coached method into ALS training and practice provides a structured and comprehensive approach to managing cardiac arrest, increasing the chances of a favorable patient outcome and maintains the safety of those involved. After a cardiac arrest, the immediate and meticulous post-arrest care is paramount to optimise patient outcomes and mitigate complications. This encompasses monitoring and maintaining vital parameters such as blood pressure, oxygenation and temperature, often with the assistance of advanced therapeutic measures like targeted temperature management. Additionally, it's essential to identify and address the potential underlying causes of the cardiac arrest. Utilising investigations like a 12-lead ECG and blood tests. One of the critical steps in post-arrest care is the consideration for transferring the patient to a high care setting, such as the intensive care unit. The ICU provides specialised monitoring and interventions, tailored for the complex needs of post-arrest patients, to ensure they receive comprehensive and holistic care, maximising the chances of a positive long-term outcome. Despite our best efforts, the reality is that many patients who suffer a cardiac arrest will not survive. Navigating the aftermath of an unsuccessful resuscitation is a delicate and multifaceted process that requires both clinical tact and compassionate communication. The following is an outline of points to consider should this occur. Communication with the family. It is of utmost importance to approach the family with sensitivity and empathy. The primary physician or senior clinician present should explain the patient's condition, the efforts made to resuscitate and the unfortunate outcome. Utilising clear, non-medical terminology and allowing the family time to ask questions and process the information is crucial. Debrief. After an unsuccessful resuscitation, a debrief with the resuscitation team and involved ward staff is vital. This process allows the team to reflect on the arrest understand what went well and what could be improved upon, and provide emotional support to each other. 
legal obligations. We are legally required to issue a death certificate detailing the cause of death, typically completed by the attending physician. Depending on the nature of the death, especially if it's sudden or unexpected, we may need to alert authorities like the police or the coroner, especially if the death occurs within the first 24 hours of hospital admission. If a post-mortem or autopsy is deemed necessary, proper consent and documentation processes are followed. It's also our duty to promptly inform the patient's GP about the unfortunate outcome. Documentation, documenting the resuscitation event, the interventions tried, the times, and the eventual outcome in the patient's medical record is essential for both clinical and legal reasons. Personal belongings. Ensure that the patient's personal belongings are safely collected and handed over to the family. Cultural and religious considerations. It is important to be mindful and respectful of any cultural or religious practices related to death and dying, accommodating them wherever possible. Lastly, given the emotional toll of such events, extend counselling services to both the affected family and staff affected can aid in coping with the trauma of an unexpected loss. These steps ensure that both the emotional and logistical challenges of an unsuccessful resuscitation are handled with the utmost care and professionalism. My Health PD. More than just CPD.